and once he comes over. What's the weather like in Pittsburgh this morning? It is cold and snowy here in Pittsburgh. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yes, too I'm cold and snowy. Some sunshine. Well, yeah, please send some our way. I could really appreciate it. <laughs> we have uh, uh, about a foot of snow on the ground, and we've had a lot of school delays for our daughters. And, <laughs> Uh, it's been pretty. It's been pretty intense. I'm sure, your daughter does not mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're gonna tell me it's in the 80s there. I'm sure. How about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're invited to travel and have a vacation at this time. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll definitely uh, have to look into that. Okay. I, I teach this course every, uh, you know, January through March, and uh, we have so many students from, you know, Jamaica and Bahamas and Guyana, and it's, it's really not fair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started with a word of prayer? We may have a few other people joining us as we go, and uh, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, thank you for this group. Uh, just, uh, we praise you for what you've done already in this course with us being able to get to know each other from different parts of the world and to learn from each other, to hear about our different perspectives. So God, we pray that for this time today, this important topic that we have of the theological understanding of justice, that you would guide our conversations, guide my words and everyone who's going to be making comments as we work through uh, this topic today. We need your wisdom. All theology flows from you. All life flows from you. And so. Uh, Again, God, we, uh, we praise you and give you the, all the glory for this time together and help us to learn and grow. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And uh, Dr. Martin, welcome. Glad you could join us for a little while. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, just being part of this group. Yeah. And it's good to see Margot face to face. And hey, Lou. And, and uh, talk. Hello, Dr. Martin. Good to see you. Uh, Yes, we finally can see each other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, hey there. Uh, so before we jump into the, the content today, uh, and hopefully, uh, so on here we have Haile and Natong and Margo. Uh, hopefully we'll have Summer who will be able to join us eventually here. And uh, also uh, Sarah is, uh, and Marcel hopefully can join us. Sarah is uh, auditing the course, but she will be participating in uh, some of these Zoom rooms and some of the group discussions and most of the online discussions as well. So our group is, is taking shape. We're making a lot of progress. Uh, the, uh, I know everybody posted in the online uh, discussion last week, and I hope you'll notice that I posted your grades for that. Uh, so you can go in there and see that. And I'll be posting, I'm a little delayed on the attendance grades as I'm trying to uh, work through that for the first time. I want to make sure I get it right. So I'll, I'll have those posted uh, as well, the attendance part of, of your grade. But everybody's doing a great job. Uh, I was just talking a little bit uh, with, with Hailu uh, before we started, uh, while, while we were just getting ready for the Zoom room and just uh, talking about the flow of working and keeping up with with your graduate level studies and uh, everything that goes into that so you know in general i'm looking for that first post by wednesday and as much as you can interact uh, with your classmates especially uh, in a smaller class like we have uh, for this group uh, the more posts that you can do and you you've been doing a great job so this isn't a reprimand or something but uh, the more posts that you can do uh, back and forth with each other in that online classroom uh, are really helpful so uh, thank you for engaging there uh, i'll be posting this recording for this zoom room as well for for anyone who may have missed it uh, looks like we have marcel uh, just joined us as well marcel do you want to say hello Hello everyone. I'm happy to be here a second time. All right. Welcome. So we were just going over some of the basics of uh, of the course. Before I start into the content for today, uh, a, a couple other things I wanted to highlight is, is just a reminder that your first book report is due this week. You can upload that. So if you're taking a BGU course for the first time, if you need any help with that, just let me know. I'd be happy to assist. 
uh, but it's, it's pretty self-explanatory and popularly the way that you upload your book report. Uh, so I usually uh, try to read those within a few days and get back to you. So you should have some feedback right away. Just a reminder that this first one is just going to be, uh, you're, you know, you're submitting it. I'm just going to get back to you with some feedback uh, so that you can understand what the expectations are for the book reports. Uh, looks like we have um, Sarah just joined us as well. Welcome, Sarah. Want to say hello? Am I on mute? Okay. Hi. Good morning. Or hello, wherever you are. <laughs> hello, Sarah. All right. So, Hi, uh, Sarah. any uh, any other questions about? And so, the the online uh, assignment for this week is to post a case study from one from Half the Sky and one from When Helping Hurts. So a case study, again, both of those books are filled with many stories of examples that the authors provided to kind of reinforce some of the uh, points that they're making. Uh, and just as a reminder, that's BGU's approach to learning. It's not just going to be theory. We want it to be really practical as well. So we have a lot to learn from the different case studies throughout the books. Uh, you know, you don't have to write word for word everything right out of the book as the case study. Hopefully you can provide a summary and share some of your thoughts about um, about the case studies in each of those books and then you know interact with each other over the, over the content of those case studies so that's all happening this week uh, and uh, next week we'll be uh, not going to have a zoom room will be uh, just online content there's actually because there's no zoom room next week there's going to be uh, two discussion topics uh, they're both related to racial justice as we talked about in the zoom room last week it's really impossible to talk about uh, poverty and social justice without also talking about diversity and and the underlying issues of race and class uh, that are so prevalent in so many cultures around the world. So we're going to take a deep dive into that next week. We'll be led by uh, Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil, uh, who uh, we have her book on the required reading list. And also uh, I have a video lecture from her that she shared at Movement Day uh, in New York City that's just a really powerful message. So that's what you can expect next week, and then we'll come back with the live Zoom room in week four. So before I jump into the, the content for today, are there any questions about, uh, you know, practical things from the class that anyone has any questions about? Just one observation. Um, I, I noticed on, um, in the to-do list, it said something about the fir first book report due on the 23rd, but I'm hearing you say this week. Yeah, so the first book report is due this week. And it can be, hopefully, it'll be for either When Helping Hurts or Half the Sky, whichever one uh, you want to try to submit this week. Uh, but just, So try to upload it in the online classroom and Populi. There should be a link there where you upload it, and then I'll be able to, I'll receive it and uh, grade it and get back to you, or, or, or give you feedback and get back to you. Well, I, I've started to work on um, Half the Sky. I think you still have to give me some feedback on the situation that I posited earlier in yeah. terms of using Ben in the um, in the immersion at, in Fresno. Yeah, that was a separate email that you sent. Uh, I think yesterday or the day before, right? No, we had this discussion last week on the Zoom room. Okay, can you say your question again so I can understand you? L last week. I said to you that um, I used the book When Helping Hurts um, in Fresno in the immersion um, program. And you said to me you were going to get back to me after consulting with somebody. I think it's Dr. Judy. And you let me know how, how should I approach that. Because you had asked for the first two books to be When Helping Hurts and Half the Sky. Yeah. I don't know if you remember you follow now. Me. <laughs> I do. Sorry, Marcel. I, I remember exactly what you're talking about now. So I'll get back to you about that for sure uh, separately. I'll email you, okay? Okay. All right. Professor? Yes. Okay. I, I couldn't find the uh, e-book on When Helping Hurts, so I'm still waiting for the arrival of the hard copy. Okay. Uh, so I'm reading Half the Sky. Now, the case study. Do we take any story from the book? and discuss it or there is yeah i don't see anything that says case study in the book 
Yeah, so it's really a case study would be an example that the authors for in your situation, half this guy, they share a story. Pretty much every chapter in that book has a story right. that they're kind of tracking with. So what I'm not looking for is for you to write out word for word everything that the authors wrote. Assume that everybody else has the book and that they, uh, but if you do reference the page number and the stories that you're referring to, just provide a high level summary. And then I'm just looking for, uh, one of the things we're looking for is critical thinking. So I just want you to interact a little bit with that case study to get the, the discussion going in the online classroom. Okay, all right, great. Yeah. So, yep. And uh, again, we're trying to, a lot of different learning methods. So these case studies are just one example of trying to get some discussions going in the group uh, and, and kind of moving forward that way. So good question though. I have one question. Sure, yeah. Um, I think this might be new since I was fully a student at BGU, but did you, you were talking last week about how we can potentially get some of the reading the books, the recommended reading books on like a digital copy or I don't know if we can put them on like our Kindle or something. Is that, how do you do that? Yeah, so the, the best way to do that, and uh, this is the first year that the courses I'm teaching that, that there are, we're emphasizing the library so much. And that's opening up the, the fact that uh, there are some of these books available in BGU's online library. So the pr simple process with that is just to send an email to Jennifer Roman, who is the librarian at BGU. And she'll get back to you right away. She's super responsive. Uh, she'll let you know uh, if the book that you're requesting is available or not. Uh, so right. in, in, in like a PDF form. Some of the books that she's, she's copied into PDF and has made available um, for students. Um, otherwise, she, she, would, she would be the best person to ask about whether there's a Kindle version available or where you might be able to find the, the book for the cheapest if BGU doesn't have it. Okay, great. Thanks. Her, her email is jennifer.roman at bgu.edu. And it's on the, sil the course syllabus if you want to um, uh, check it out there. So, good question. Yeah, yeah. I have a question, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as um, we briefly discussed it before this room has started, I found that uh, the timetable for the assignment and for the reading is, is uh, very uh, strict. And um, I would like to ask uh, what is the level of flexibility to really make learning smooth? I know that participation is very important and um, it's a good way of learning, but as we have also fulfilling other commitment, um, we might miss some of the deadlines and um, how flexible is the learning environment? Yeah, because this is my first course with uh, BGU. Um, are we just going to follow the same style that by Wednesday I have to do something and if I'm not doing it, my grade is going to be not okay or do we give it some kind of flexibility to, to yeah. attending? I mean, I like, for example, the recorded video um, even if I was not happy or missing last week's discussion, but I still um, have got an opportunity of going through what others have discussed. So that is yeah. what I wanted to ask. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, my answer to that is that um, one of the things that BGU is trying to do is to bring some consistency across the board. And that also has to do with accreditation for our university is to have consistency in our attendance uh, with all of our courses. Um, so I would just say uh, my standard is, uh, is BGU standard is we want you to try to do your best to follow along with the due dates for the assignments and participate in everything uh, as much as you possibly can. But also saying that BGU works with working adults all over the world and we understand there are gonna be some times when you need some flexibility. Uh, so my big thing with that is just communication. Mm -hmm. So if I don't hear from you all week and you haven't posted anything or joined the Zoom room, then when it gets to the end of the week, I'm gonna be wondering what happened to you and why you didn't participate that week. Versus if you can see, uh, you know, what your week schedule is going to look like and you know that you're just not going to be able to get something done by Wednesday, if you could just send me an email just to let me know or, I'll, you know, however is best to communicate with me, uh, just to keep me aware of what's going on. 
particularly <laughs> earlier in the class in the courses when they start I know everybody's getting acclimated so I have a lot more grace in weeks one and weeks two than I do in weeks five and six you know especially if I don't hear from you um, so I usually if I don't hear from you uh, through the course of week you'll usually get an email from me just kind of asking if you're doing okay and what's going on um, but that's generally how we go about it so uh, I will say that you'll lose points in your attendance grade if you miss a whole week and you don't do the zoom room or the the online mm -hmm. discussion and you haven't communicated with me then you'll lose points on your attendance grade for that week which it's a really small part of your grade so it probably won't have a huge impact on it um, but my main thing is communication so mm -hmm. I, uh, may, may I also in, interject uh, Brian um, hey Louis, since this is your first class with BGU, um, are you, do you need some help just navigating with Populi or um, navigating with it within the course? Um, I think um, uh, navigating through the Populi is okay and uh, mm -hmm. my problem was just to catch up with things because I was yeah. uh, home on leave, internet was off, and oh, when yeah. I come to my workplace, you find a lot of email to go through. Just yeah. catching up with study and mm -hmm. work yeah. is the, yeah. the, the yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, mm -hmm. I think uh, the help system is there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. More or less, I know whom to yeah. contact if I need yeah. help. But yeah. uh, the time constraint is only thing I, I mm -hmm. had these two yeah. weeks. Yeah. But, uh, Hopefully, I will catch up uh, gradually. Very good. Um, also, I know that in your country, sometimes they shut down the internet and it's difficult to communicate then. Um, after, when they resume the internet, just let us know. Uh, we had an internet shut down for three days or whatever. Okay, I know that happens uh, in your country. So uh, we do understand those situations and we take them into the account. But as Dr. Brian said, uh, if you know that you have a professional commitment, you cannot attend a Zoom meeting or um, you have another situation, you travel for three days, just let Dr. Brian know and send him an email. Try to just anticipate um, and be proactive with communication. And I mean, I'm your advisor, so if there's any other issues, uh, if you need more help in any way, um, I'm ready to help you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Martin, for that. I will do that. Um, currently, I'm in South Sudan. My workplace is South Sudan. And um, internet connection is not a problem so far. Last week, I was in Ethiopia, and uh, there, there was uh, where I had internet yeah. connection problems. So I, yeah, will I know that in Ethiopia, it's now difficult. And also my professor now in future when I'm having mm -hmm. such a thing. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, this, these are good questions. I, I, I wanna to get to our content for the day, but I wanna make sure everybody has, if you have any of these additional logistical questions, just let me know. Okay, sorry, I have one more. Yeah. Did you already go over the final project and when we'll, when we'll start to talk and plan for that? Yeah, the, the, uh, the final project will, uh, so I have not gone over the specific details of it. And I left it intentionally a little bit vague in the syllabus, so there will be an individual project. But over the next couple of weeks, we'll start getting some more information about that. Uh, your group project will relate specifically to helping you work on your individual project. And your individual project will be based on one of the poverty alleviation tools that we go over in the, in the course. Uh, throughout. Mostly in weeks four, five, and six, we're going to introduce a different tool each week that you'll be able to take a look at. And as we're doing that, you'll decide which one that you want to do uh, in your specific context uh, as, as a, a method of uh, research and uh, moving towards poverty alleviation in your context. So we'll definitely uh, have more information on that as we move forward. All right. Okay. Uh, why don't we move into today's content and if anyone has any questions I'm always available uh, you can email me separately uh, and we'll, we'll get it sorted out uh, we're talking about 
uh, biblical justice today. And one of the articles that I posted in the online classroom for Populi for week two was to read the article by Dr. Keller. So uh, if you read the article, you're feeling really great right now. If you didn't read the article, don't panic. You can still contribute to the conversation today. And hopefully you can kind of read through all of that uh, over these next couple days. And then if you can post some things online. Uh, again, one of the things we're looking for in your online discussions is for you to incorporate the content that we're introducing into your uh, comments that you're making. So uh, as I was sharing last week, you can say, make a statement in the online classroom uh, without backing it up, but it's better if you can back it up with maybe something from Keller's article or something from Half the Sky or When Helping Hurts. Uh, make sure you have those books and articles handy as you're uh, making your online discussions. And that will also help you uh, as you move towards your final project to incorporate those quotes into uh, the final project that you have. I picked Dr. Keller's article because I felt like it was a really great overview of a biblical understanding of justice. This topic of social justice is actually pretty controversial in many cultures. Uh, in the United States where I am, just for instance, uh, there are a group of people who think uh, of Christians who think social justice is a negative connotation. Uh, it's, it's the social gospel. It's taking evangelism and, and uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with words out of the gospel. And they think it's just focusing on helping people who are poor or marginalized, uh, which couldn't be any further from the truth. But a lot of that is kind of deeply rooted in the history of the United States and our inability to deal with our our complex issues that we have. Uh, so that's just one example from here. And then, you know, on the, on the other side, you have a group of people who are more activists, who are Christians, who are really passionate about serving the poor and, and reaching people on the margins, uh, who don't have a, a really good understanding of people who maybe uh, don't do that or aren't involved. And so there's, there's kind of the, uh, in the United States and in other circles, it's, it's sometimes perceived as a conservative divide and a liberal divide, uh, social gospel uh, versus just using words to share the gospel. And what I like about Dr. Keller's article is he presents more of a full holistic uh, impression of, of the theology of justice. Uh, and, uh, and so he kind of bridges those two worlds and brings them together. So uh, before we dive into his article, I wanted to start with a question. Uh, does anyone uh, in your context uh, with what I just shared, you know, is there, a, is there a divide in your context between people who are activists and more socially engaged with the gospel um, versus people who are kind of more, I guess, super spiritual and maybe not as in, engaged with, uh, with deeds? Um, we, we don't have to hear from everybody, but does anyone want to share from your context about that? Go ahead, Hailu. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think um, in the case of Ethiopia uh, Church, um, you don't see much division, but you see the majority of the Christian denomination is um, leaving out the, um, the social justice issue aside and um, focusing only on what they call that it is uh, serving the Lord and preaching the gospel and um, uh, meeting the spiritual needs. And of course, there are some churches who are also doing a development, um, who are committed to serve the poor, um, like the organization I'm working for, World Vision is doing that. And uh, some few churches in Ethiopia are also doing that. But when it comes to advocating for justice, for social justice, for, for um, you know, correcting the, um, the wrongs which is being done by one group to others, uh, most of our churches seem to be silent on that issue. And... Uh, just focusing on teaching the Bible to the people. And um, they seem that we have to leave the other aspect for God to, to take care of it, as if it is not um, our problem or our responsibility. So that is uh, basically what we see. And um, in organizations like um, World Vision and others, we focus on serving the community's physical needs 
leaving out the spiritual needs. So always you can't find really the balanced kind of um, addressing both. As you said, uh, you see from uh, Tim Keller's article. Uh, I think uh, I was very much impressed when I was going through it. Uh, it showed me that even helping others is, is addressing justice. I used to understand justice as related to the relationship between the powerful and the powerless or the, the politically powerful people and uh, the, the people in general. So I was looking at justice as just maybe uh, applying the law, um, allowing people to practice their democratic right and those kind of things. But uh, this article, I think, has helped me to understand that right relationship uh, in when we are interacting with people and also the um, the relationship between the have and the have not. Uh, sharing what I have with someone who don't have is, is also justice. So it's just broadened my understanding of what justice means from, uh, from the biblical point of view. So yeah, that is what I wanted to share. Yeah, that's, that's a great example, exactly what I was looking for. Uh, because one of the things that we hope that happens through your journey at BGU is that you will, uh, many people feel overwhelmed by that divide of, of churches and organizations that are socially active and meeting physical needs and those who are kind of more focused on spiritual needs. Uh, we want you to uh, view yourself as a transformational leader who can move amongst the powerful and the powerless with ease and who can move amongst circles that are utilizing words and some that are utilizing actions uh, just as Jesus did and as Jesus modeled for his disciples. Uh, sometimes Jesus used words, oftentimes Jesus used works and uh, both are kind of uh, full expressions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we saw that played out with his followers in the early church and through the apostles as well. Uh, so there's no need to be overwhelmed by uh, some of the, the different ideologies, uh, but it's important to be able to understand them and, and kind of help to move the leaders in your city towards a more holistic expression of the gospel. Um, so thank you for those examples. Anyone else uh, want to share a, a specific example from your context just like that? Yes, Dr. Um, yes. Dr. Brian. Um, I, I would say in, in our context... I'm just share that. I think in the United States, while just... Oh. The church has really been evolving. Um, there was a time when the focus would have been just um, preaching the gospel. But over the years um, in Guyana, um, the church has really moved into preaching a more holistic gospel. And uh, we have seen the practice, like you just mentioned, of incarnational leadership, where um, where the church has no um, the church has gone into neighborhoods, and not just with the gospel, but meeting the needs of of, of people. Um, for example, the fellowship um, that I belong to, um, we have what we call feeding programs. So we do not only um, preach the gospel, but there are people who are in need. So, I mean, if you're preaching the gospel, but yet persons have needs and you're not meeting those needs, um, you know, the, your, your preaching could be questioned um, because you must recognize that people have needs too and you, and, and you could meet those needs, especially if you have the capacity to, to, to meet those needs. The other thing we have done, and I've seen happening now, the church has now moved into the realm of not only preaching and meeting the needs of people, but to empower them. For example, the fellowship that I belong to, again, we, um, we call th that fellowship, th there's a part of the fellowship that we refer to as Generation Next. Where persons may not have had a skill, um, and so they, they could come to this center. They, they're taught masonry, plumbing, and uh, e electricity, different subjects that they could actually become um, earners for themselves in terms of getting their own income and releasing them back into the society so that they could live purpose-driven lives. So the, the church in, in Guyana has really evolved from just um, the spiritual aspect of just preaching without recognizing, as Jesus did, um, um, you know, there's some Greek words that, that we use, the koinonia, 
um, charismatic and the diaconic, that's the, the serving part, and the empowering part, as well as the preaching part. So um, these areas, you know, we've been focusing strongly on, on those areas in terms of a more holistic gospel. What I enjoyed about reading Keller's article is that many times when, you know, we speak of justice, and it was really a defining for me, because sometimes you just look at it in the context of um, people, in, in the context of punishment and not looking at what might be the rights of persons, not looking at what might be significant in terms of empowering them so that they could really enjoy and live prosperous lives. So I, I found the article very informative, and I think it really touched on a variety of, of areas in relation to justice, especially the part when it says that it really entails the character of God also. So if we are Christian people, and if we, if we preach in Christ, we, we need to demonstrate his character, which will also include the holistic gospel. So I believe the church in Guyana has really come a far way with respect to the preaching of the gospel. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. That's, that's a great example how, uh, how churches can preach and teach and model this behavior. Uh, and in your churches, then you have lots of people who are in the different sectors of society that can then go out and uh, live out the gospel in tangible ways. How does that, how does that uh, you know, taking off your, your local church hat for a second and putting on your minister of education hat, uh, are you able, do you view that work that you do um, uh, for your full-time job as kind of, uh, uh, you know, living out the, the, the social component of the gospel? I think by the time I left BGU, I might convert the entire Ministry of Education um, <laughs> because we, we I mean, I'll tell you the truth, Dr. Brian, many of the things that I've learned so far, um, I have started to apply the whole concept of consultation and, and sharing with people and listening to people and hearing their views and putting ideas together and so on. So um, I have done a lot of work um, because I, I'm not the Minister of Education, I'm the Chief Education Officer, which is a little different um, in, our, in our context. Okay. Um, there's a minister, someone who's above me, but I, I chair a group called the Education Systems Committee, <coughs> excuse me, and that group is responsible for really um, managing and delivering education across the country. And I, 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 um, some of them, they've begun to start talking like me because we talk about servant leadership. I'm talking about, you know, being service oriented. We're not lords, we're not gods. We're there to serve, to empower. So I've been using the information gleaned from Baki University in, 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 in my workplace. And I've seen lots of persons, they're speaking differently. I think, you know, it just takes one person to light the fire before we could see some kind of movement. You know? Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Uh, Sarah, I think that was you that were, I think you were starting to share. Did you want to uh, jump in here? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, even though I'm not in South Sudan, my internet kind of sucks too. So I'm um, sorry about that. But um, I, I was just saying in the States, I think um, justice also um, is more, has been more widely accepted in the evangelical world these days. But what I find now um, is kind of the mix up between charity and justice, like Tim Keller was talking about. And um, I think that's even harder sometimes than the, the outright kind of, um, you know, the negative response to the social gospel. That, that's something that maybe we can speak to in a different way. But when churches, um, you know, when churches think that they're doing justice, but they're really just doing a kind of toxic charity, um, that, that is really challenging that I find. So um, we have a lot of churches that reach out to my organization and want to come down and do a project, like a one-day project or, or you know, whatever. Um, and they're really unwilling to kind of put the resources behind um, true change or true equity. They just would rather pass out t-shirts or do whatever. And so I think that's a big challenge as far as getting at the systemic, the systemic causes of injustice and inequity and how, and, and how to move the church, the evangelical church in the United States into a place of sacrificial um, commitment to justice, especially under the current administration and, and with the current, um, some of the current, you know, discussions that are happening around um, racial justice and, and those things. So I think that is what I've seen 
recently in, in the current state of the United States. Yeah, that is, uh, you really uh, touched on some, some big issues. I mean, one of the things that happened in the U.S. after the book When Helping Hurts came out was that a lot of churches just said, okay, we're not even going to do missions anymore, which was the opposite of what the authors were hoping for. Uh, but then you kind of had this, uh, this other uh, perspective, which is that a lot of evangelical Christians in the U.S. are not able to understand um, systemic issues or that, that lead to uh, injustices uh, because so much of evangelical faith in the U.S. is an individualized kind of private uh, faith. So, um, yeah, you really highlighted a lot of, a lot of those, those issues well. And I think uh, it's interesting that Tim Keller is being kind of a more of a conservative evangelical guy. Uh, he's, he seems to be a trusted source by a lot of evangelicals who are uh, kind of timidly moving into the area of justice. So thanks for sharing that perspective. Anyone else? Uh, Margo, go ahead. Um, yeah, Tim Keller's uh, his, uh, writing was excellent. And uh, when I think about it and think about my context in the Bahamas uh, for many years, and I've been a pastor along with my husband for about 15 years, uh, but I grew up in the church. So uh, being Christian is not new. It's been many, many years. But uh, in the Bahamas, Christians, uh, they, they almost always believe that um, justice was is strictly the word mispat, I think uh, was, is the way they say it. Mispat, the punishment of wrongdoing, period. And so the church uh, did not uh, necessarily got involved in um, social injustice. And um, there was always a benevolent committee to do the charity, to feed the poor, but uh, it, it, it never seemed like that was necessarily the gospel, but it was something the women can do. Uh, but the gospel was basically, like Marcel said in Guyana, uh, we did evangelism. We preached uh, uh, for salvation, and uh, we had a soup kitchen, but uh, not giving a voice for the orphans or, or for the... Well, the, bit, the widows in the church would have been taken care of, but uh, what Keller gives is a very holistic view of righteousness, acts of righteousness, and it's, it's a valuable uh, piece of information. And uh, I've learned certainly a lot to be more sensitive to uh, what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling and what needs to happen more on a widespread now, my husband and I, uh, we've stepped out of the religious box a long time ago, and <laughs> it has created some conflict, but we see that um, more and more evangelicals are joining us in speaking up for social justice and justice in terms of empowering people. And so uh, starting social enterprises and encouraging people uh, in that form of um, being more holistic with the gospel has been uh, a definitely a beautiful journey. It's been a struggle, but more people are joining us in this move. So uh, I thank God for this article and, and how it's broadening my uh, ideas or information on what is social justice. That's great, Margot. Uh as you were speaking, I was a little curious because you mentioned in your introduction last week that you've been through four hurricanes there and that a lot of people have left. What's been the response of the churches to the uh, devastation of a hurricane? Uh, is, it, is the church widely regarded as engaging and being part of the solutions or, or is it more the kind of charitable aid organizations and relief organizations that people look to when a crisis happens? The church has been slow uh, and mostly they will provide food and clothing. But the church in the Bahamas continues to look heavily to the government. And uh, my husband and I, we have stopped that a long time ago. And we continue to share the idea that we are responsible for the people um, because it is righteousness. And uh, so more and more people, more and more evangelicals are joining. My husband 
in fact, just recently started something called Pastors Alliance because there is a um, there's a Christian council, but it is strongly religious. Uh, they are only preaching and bringing churches together for prayer meetings. But when we speak in the media, we talk about social justice. We talk about uh, what's happening um, in the economy. And um, so with the hurricanes, the government has still leads the way in terms of supporting people and churches are slowly getting on board with uh, uh, helping in that sense. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for sharing about that. Uh, Margo, do you think this is typical in the Caribbean? Because when I was in Haiti and I spent there three years uh, and went through a couple of hurricanes, it was a similar situation. Uh, what I believe it may be typical in the Caribbean because governments have become almost like small GODS, gods. In the Caribbean or in the Bahamas, uh, people are very political and governments tend to, they will do things for people who support their parties. And so people look to the government for everything. They look to the government for jobs, for food, for clothing, for shelter. And, and this is what ha, uh, really creates a problem um, in terms of even political uprisings because uh, people tend to look to the government as a God to provide everything. And that's why the church needs to uh, become stronger and become more influential so that we train people to trust God, the true living God, because it is he who gives us the power to get wealth. It is he who has given us gifts and talents to empower ourselves and to empower our neighbors and to, and to be uh, righteous in terms of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. But when people continue to look to the government as they do in the Bahamas, then a lot of things will not get done because the government cannot do everything. Now, earlier as a child, I believe our, our communities were smaller. And so families tend to take care of themselves. And in churches, even churches worked with families in the church. But as we grew bigger and we have more migrants, now we have more problems of poverty because there are families that are not related. And the church never had to deal with that before. Yeah. Thank you, sir, and Michael. So that you found that to be similar, uh, Dr. Martin, in your context? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, that was very similar. It's from what I hear, it's still going on. I bet um, over there. Okay. Um, Natong, uh, since everybody else has had the chance to share about their context a little bit, uh, why don't we have you jump in here and share a little bit about what it's like where you are? Yeah. Uh, since I have been reading about the half the skies, many thoughts in my mind. Especially when I'm thinking about my country. See, my country has been at war for, let's say, about 50 years. And many people are suffering. Even in my place, there are thousands of refugees. And currently, as you people may know, many of the Bengali people are fleeing Myanmar to Bangladesh. Maybe about 5 lakhs or something. So when I'm thinking about these things, and uh, the current uh, political situation in Myanmar. So, and when we are learning about this social justice, what I, I'm thinking about my country is that uh, many of the organizations, let's say NGO organizations are organized by Christians. Um, many Christian people are taking care of the women and the, some poor people but they are doing it as individual persons, not, not in relationship with church. So what I want to point out is, as individual, many Christians are involved in social justice, but as a church, we still them, we never talk about um, this uh, girls, 
being sold into China or, or being sold into Thailand. We never speak about that. Uh, many people are fleeing Myanmar in western part of Myanmar and in the northern part. The wars are going on. But as a church, we avoid, I mean, condemning these things. So is this part of the social justice or so? Maybe that's because we are feeling in spreading the gospel. So, yeah. So my question for you is: What would, with everything going on with all those big issues, what does what would justice look like for you in your context? <clears throat> uh, especially the evangelicals. These days, the Roman Catholic Church they are they are speaking up against government to take care of the refugees or the INDBs in our country. But we Baptists, especially the evangelicals, still we are not taking the issue with the government or we are, let's say, virtually we are silent about the suffering of the people. Yeah. Well, I think, uh... You know, again, so many, uh, thanks for sharing about your context and there's so many uh, areas for improvement uh, that I think uh, Christians can make. I know, uh, I noticed this a couple years ago, I went to a global event uh, that's with a global organization I'm connected to. And uh, there were a lot of Christian NGO leaders there that were talking about how to do integral mission and holistic mission. Uh, there were very few church leaders there, but at that time, I, I'm, I still am a pastor. I was a pastor just kind of showing up to figure out how I could, you know, mobilize the people that I lead to get more involved in making a difference. And um, there was a lot of, that was a really eye-opening time for me to see globally, internationally. I think there's a big disconnect between, you know, NGO organizations and local churches. And one of my passions is to hopefully see that, that gap be bridged, to see uh, much more uh, communication, better relationships and collaboration uh, between churches and NGOs. So, uh, you know, and it sounds like from what I'm hearing in this group that that's, that's happening in, in different places around the world. So hopefully, I'm hopeful that that can happen in your context as well. Uh, what I wanna do is uh, share a little bit about uh, the, let me get on the right, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you and just wanted to go through a few of the things from the article and get some dis discussions going. So you're all doing a great job of, uh, of sharing and I appreciate that. Let me share my screen here and let me see. As I've uh, highlighted in the article, I was really inspired by Dr. Gornick's uh, story that Tim Keller started out with. And that similar is a little bit uh, my journey into Homewood. Uh, when I first started the LAMP mentoring program in Homewood, I spent three years kind of driving into the neighborhood. And it wasn't until reading about incarnational leadership and learning more about it that I, I realized that you can move your family into the neighborhood in order to, to be present there and to be more effective. So that's the, the narrative that my family has been living out for the past eight or nine years as just opening our home up and, and it's really helped to move things forward in the neighborhood. We've seen a lot of things happen with housing and education through our mentoring initiative and through church planning. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, as I'm listening to all the stories here, I know a lot of BGU leaders are already practicing incarnational leadership and, and kind of going all in in order to uh, be present in the neighborhoods where we serve. Uh, so the question that I had, and I'm actually going to, since we've had so much discussion already, I'm going to table that question. What does it mean to you to do justice? And can you name an example of somebody that you know who is doing justice? Uh, I feel like, you know, some of that came out when I was asking you about your context, but you can be thinking about that when I ask you to share in a few minutes here. Uh, maybe there's somebody that comes to mind in your context that you'd like to share about with the group as an example of someone who's doing justice. We talked about this idea in Dr. Keller's article of Mishpat, giving people what they are due, whether punishment or protection or care. He also referred to it as rectifying justice. Uh, 
you know, that's, that's a word whenever you do a search for justice or biblical justice, that word tends to come up a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is, I think it was Margot, you referred to it as not just, you know, punishing somebody when, when something happens, but also having a more holistic view of our people being cared for, are they being protected, are they flourishing? Uh, and, and if not, then it's important for us uh, to move in that direction. I thought it was interesting that Keller cited these four examples of people. Uh, he called them the quartet of the vulnerable, widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. I was teaching at a kid's church. Uh, it was a large church, and I was, uh, they had asked me to come and talk to their kids in kindergarten through fifth grade about biblical justice. So I, I asked uh, the kids to raise their hands if they uh, knew about these four groups of people that God really cared about. And when I, uh, when I t said orphans, all the kids raised their hands, and they could tell me what orphans were. Uh, when I talked about widows, the kids could tell me what widows were. They all kind of knew somebody who uh, had maybe been widowed. Uh, the poor, a lot of the kids in our context, they raised their hand, and they were able to tell me stories about how when they were walking around in the city, their parents had given money to a person who was homeless, and uh, they could tell me a little bit about some of the the more poor people in our city. And when I talked about immigrants and refugees, uh, none of the kids could tell me what a refugee was. Out of There was probably four or 500 kids that I spoke to that weekend. Uh, and one, one of the kids kind of braved it and tried to answer it, and it wasn't even close. Uh, so, it, you know, that really highlighted in the United States, we have really horrible uh, policies with how to engage people from different cultures and our immigration system is in such need of reform. Uh, but it's such a hot topic political issue. Uh, it's, it's a lot of biblical illiteracy in churches in the United States around uh, that particular issue. So I spent some time that day teaching with the kids and that's part of what I do with my work here in Pittsburgh is to I do immersions with refugee groups around the city to take groups of people from different churches in Pittsburgh to go to spend time with the refugee population here in Pittsburgh to learn from them and to interact and to help create understanding and right relationships. Uh, so that's an example of, of um, you know, how I think as leaders, we can see a void and maybe step into that. And, and hopefully uh, you're able to do that in your context when you see some gaps to be able to step in that's what transformational leaders do. You become bridge builders uh, between people groups, especially where there's misunderstandings. Uh, Keller also referred to, as I said, refugees, migrant workers, homeless, single parents, older adults. There are a lot of marginalized people in our, our ever urbanizing world uh, that we have the opportunity to impact. Uh, Dr. Keller also uh, referred to this concept of Sadeka, uh, uh, which refers to a life of right relationships. He also described it as primary justice. It's behavior that if it was prevalent in the world would render rectifying justice unnecessary because everyone would be living in right relationship with everyone else. Uh, in the article, he gave the example, he gave some specific examples of how he saw that being played out. Uh, in one of the articles he wrote, it could also mean a group of families from a more prosperous side of town adopting the public school in a poor community and making generous donations of money and pro bono work in order to improve the quality of education there. Uh, and that jumped out to me in our LAMP partnership when the Pittsburgh Public Schools invited churches to come in and mentor kids. It also led to a lot of other things like helping to clean up the schools and hallway monitors who helped to make sure the kids were safe when they were walking down the street. When gun violence takes place in the neighborhood, we often have volunteers from the church that come and help the kids get to and from school and make, sa make sure that they're safe. Uh, we do a harvest party each year to uh, bless uh, the community where it's too dangerous for the kids to go out in their neighborhoods. Uh, we have a special uh, big block party for them. And we have a staff appreciation luncheon for the teachers at the school just to let them know that we care about them and that we appreciate the efforts that they're putting in. Uh, so. There are lots of different tangible ways to be able to do that, to live that out. Uh, and then I asked you to maybe kind of think through if you can name an example of how primary justice is being worked out in your context. So again, I'm gonna ask you in just a minute maybe to, to think that through to give a specific example. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight this concept of radical generosity that Dr. Keller uh, highlighted. Despite the effort to draw a line between justice as legal fairness and sharing as charity, and this is, I'm just reading this right from the article, numerous scripture passages make radical generosity 
one of the marks of living justly. The just person lives a life of honesty, equity, and generosity in every aspect of his or her life. Uh, one of the things when I went through BGU's DMIN program that stood out to me was Dennis Bakke's example of, uh, you know, Ray always talks about his, his billionaire brother, uh, but it was really interesting to hear what was behind this, uh, this billionaire brother who was living on 1% of his income and giving away 99% of his income, which I'm sure he still had a very comfortable lifestyle. Uh, but that really stuck with me when I heard about that. You can read more in uh, Dennis Bakke's book, Joy at Work, about the culture that he created with the company that he started to make sure that people were, were thriving. Um, but I, that still really stuck with me. What would it look like to live on 1% of, a, of your income and give away radically 99% of it? Uh, it, it always kind of stuck with me. Uh, so, um, how have you tried to live out radical generosity in your context? So maybe, maybe think that through a little bit as well. Uh, so I'm actually going to pause there. There's, there's, if we have time, some things from the book, When Helping Hurts, that I want to try to work through. Uh, but let me stop sharing my screen here. And, uh, you know, maybe think through, uh, just to get the conversation going. Uh, oops, lost everybody. Uh, the questions that I just kind of mentioned as I went through there are, were, um, can you name an example of how primary justice is being worked out in your context? Another question I asked was, have you tried to live out radical generosity in your context? And what does that even look like? Uh, and I also asked, um, can you name an example of somebody that you know that is kind of doing justice in your, in your environment? So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. You can raise your hand or you can uh, just jump in here and share. Did I overwhelm you with too many questions at once? Okay. <laughs> I'll start. Thank uh, you. For me, radical justice is, um, you know, when I think about the hurricanes and, uh, and how things got really difficult economically in the Bahamas, for me, radical generosity is going into your pantry in the house and remembering what the Bible says, if you have two coats, you give one away. And, and so I go into my pantry and I look at the food items and I said, okay, I'm going to split it in half, even to the point of where if there's two, I will have to give one. And, and so recently someone um, just shared, was sharing in a group about uh, how difficult it was for them to find food. And this was someone that looked well, always had cars and nice home, but our family was finding difficulty uh, with food because unemployment is very high right now in the Bahamas also. And so I simply went into my pantry and I shared everything. And, and she was amazed. And I said to her, I, she said, why did you go out shopping? I said, I, I didn't. I just shared with you what came from my pantry. And honestly, there were two cans of cream and, and there were two of other items and I gave her half. And simply because I remember the word that said, if you have two, then you can give one. And so I believe that we never have too little to give because uh, someone has less than that. So for me, that's radical generosity. Um, I don't remember the second question. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I was just asking if, uh, just to get the conversation going, if anyone had any examples of the two different types of justice uh, in your context that Dr. Keller mentioned. So. That's great though. Uh, that's a good example. And sometimes it really hits close to home. You know, it's, uh, for me, it's really tempting to look at in the United States, there are so many resources and so much money. It's, look for, it's easy for me to look at other people and be like, oh, they should be doing so much more and they should be so much more generous. Meanwhile, I'm hoarding as much as I can for myself to make sure that I'm comfortable. And <laughs> so that's a good example of sometimes it really hits you where, where it hurts. You know, you got to open up your own pantry. Who else wants to share? Um, Hi, Lou. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I think um, 
I was also impressed by the story you have shared, someone who is using 1% of his income and uh, sharing the 99%, is, which is really very absolute. But um, as a Christian, I think with my wife and uh, also with uh, my children, we, we are trying to practice to be generous. Um, we, as someone who is living in uh, uh, one of the poor country in the globe, you always see needy people around you. Um, and um, we made our cultural practice to really support some of the people around us uh, in the church or even among our family members. Uh, you may see someone who want to go to university and uh, not able to afford so uh, basically we are doing, we are practicing that, uh, even though I can't say that it is to the level that we are supposed to do. Uh, they, there is still an area that we prove and grow, but uh, we really live, uh, love sharing. And um, we also experience it, uh, God's blessing because of that. About uh, three weeks ago, I was uh, sharing in the church um, the word of God, um, which is uh, basically uh, being a light of the world, um, doing good things, and uh, demonstrating our faith in action. And after I finished the, the, the preaching, one person approached me, and he said he's walking among a group of people. Um, they call it, uh, they call the ministry love in action. And they said, I liked, I liked what you have preached, and we are already practicing it. We are collecting money, collecting clothes, visiting people in the prison, and um, in the hospital. You know, there are a lot of needy people here in South Sudan because of the war. And I was happy to hear him. And uh, when you said, do you know any example of someone who is practicing justice? I think this person and his group is the one who came to my mind among so many examples. And I said, wow, that is good. And uh, it is an opportunity for me to practice what I have already preached. So I joined him and we did something for Christmas. We gathered some money, collected some money, some clothes. And I have not joined him in visiting people in prison and the hospital, but at least I have managed to to contribute uh, something at least. And uh, even when I went to home in Ethiopia, I think uh, we are trying to practice it, especially in the church, in the neighborhood, within the family members. Uh, so, yeah. Um, the other questions I will, I will interact as I remember them. <laughs> That's an another great personal example of uh of applying it right away. It's funny when I, uh, whenever I preach a sermon, I know what's coming is I'm going to be asked to uh, grow in the area that I'm preaching about. So <laughs> I can relate a little bit to that. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to share an example of, of radical generosity or uh, an example of, of rectifying justice or primary justice being uh, worked out? Uh, Sarah, go ahead. Um, I think one example of justice being lived out in our context is um, we we serve a lot of students that are under the DACA program here in the United States, which um, has to do with um, young children that were brought over to America um, illegally by their parents, and then um, so they don't have documentation, uh, but. President Obama had an executive order that deferred any kind of deportation for these young people. They, they're called dreamers in America. And so um, in our neighborhoods, there's a lot of dreamers. And with President Trump's um, repeal of DACA or the, um, the legislation that's going on around DACA, a lot of young people who have grown up their whole life in the United States um, are being threatened with deportation. Um, and so I have two young women, they're, they're sisters. Um, they're both in college, one's getting her master's, and they are both um, undocumented. 
and they are, but they are really engaging with the political um, campaigns to help um, reform immigration in the United States and, and particularly around DACA or Dream, Dreamer students. And so they just have engaged politically in a way that has inspired me. And I think um, it's, I think it's a really important place for these dreamers to have their own voice in, in, this, um, in this fight and to really express what's happening to them and, and, the, and the injustice that it is. And so I think that that's a little bit of my frustration with the Keller article is that it still is from a pretty individualistic perspective. And I really think that these days, I think we have to, as the church, not be afraid to engage the political spectrum if we want to really see justice happening, or at least that's got to be part of it. It's both individual, just like the gospel, it's both individual and it's systemic and it, and it has to touch those realms. I think of Jesus when he overturned the tables at the temple, it was a systemic issue that he was, he was really speaking about the, the merging of, um, you know, of uh, the unjust systems of the temple merging into the, and, you know, keeping people from being able to worship God and coming into the presence of God and, and how that affected different groups of people um, in different ways. And so I think a lot, I think a lot about that when I think about um, justice and, and I think that the, I liked the article by, by Keller and I, I respect Tim Keller, but I also think, again, it still comes from a very, a very um, individual kind of perspective. And so um, I'm inspired by these young people that are that are really engaging in justice in that way. And it causes me to think about what do I have to leverage on behalf of the work that's already going on and that's being led by these young people? How, how can I support and leverage whatever resources that I have in, to see justice happen in that, in that area? That's awesome. What do you, th what would um, systemic justice in immigration reform in the United States or with the dreamer specifically look like for you? If, if you, in a dream world, if churches were engaging at the systemic level to address this issue, what would that look like for you? That's a great question. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think it would be great to just to deal with, to deal with the legislation and the issue of these dreamers without without merging it with the question of the wall, which is happening in, in the United States is there's a, you know, there's one party that's trying to tie them together, the building of the wall and, and the border wall and enforcing that with the legislation that's affecting all of these dreamers. So at least in that conversation, not having to tie those two things together would be, um, I think is important. And I think, you know, I really think we have to look at these dreamers. They're an amazing group of people, which doesn't even qualify why they should have justice. You know, everyone should have justice anyway, no matter if you're, you know, doing all these amazing things. But the dreamers group, you know, has like a 0% felony rate. Most of them are pursuing higher education. They're contributing to our, you know, economy and our whole society in amazing ways. And so, you know, they're just an unprotected group that we have to we have to fight for. So it would be great if the church could come around and, and really get, at least get into the, the issue of the dreamers and protect them. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it is very complicated, I think. Yeah, that's for sure. But that's a great perspective though. I mean, that's kind of a tangible, you can separate those two issues. And, um, you know, I think a lot of evangelical Christians are having a really hard time moving past, um, you know, the, the individual perspectives. So, um, Margo, uh, I just got your note there. So you, uh, you need to get off at 1115. Um, so that's no problem. Uh, we can touch base about that. So thanks again, um, for sharing. And just so everybody knows for your, for your planning, I know, uh, I generally schedule about two hours for the zoom rooms and usually we don't make it all the way to two hours. Um, especially with a small group like this, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, you know, if you're, if you're planning for your purposes, but you can always go back and listen to the recording if you end up having to, to get off. So Sarah, thanks for that perspective. And, uh, you know, I noticed a little bit of the, of the, 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 after President Trump's comments last week, uh, last week about Africa and Haiti and and El Salvador and other countries, uh, that a lot of people were, you know, 
the, the, the debate in the United States and social media was, oh, no, I know a whole bunch of really good, you know, African people and Haitian people and people from El Salvador, uh, you know, but that shouldn't even really, you know, play into it, uh, especially if, if we're followers of Jesus Christ, that all human life has value and um, that we need to embrace everybody. So uh, now a lot of that discussion is really playing out uh, in the U.S. Uh, any other comments? Uh, from anyone else on the, on some of those questions I have. How, how have you seen radical generosity play out in your context? Marcel, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Um, I, I believe that, you know, leadership is so critical. And to my mind, it, it is everything. The kind of leadership that, you know, one brings to the, to the table. Um, I've seen a number of presidents in my time in this country and I've seen some of them who were keen on, on maintaining power, um, remaining in power, and therefore um, the concept of dividing and ruling would have been the most appropriate um, leadership style for them so that they could actually remain in power. But of recent, we have, we've got a new president, and uh, I believe that this particular president is one who is leading the way in terms of um, in terms of justice. Um, this particular president um, has moved in the direction to build relationships among the races, the um, Zadka, um, in, in right relationships to the extent that he's even established what he calls a, a, a ministry of social cohesion, where races are able to, um, they're able to, to bring some of the issues that they are experiencing um, to the fore and they're able to, to, to um, debate, they're able to discuss issues that they have and to chart a way forward in terms, of, in terms of making the kind of progress and building the relationship that we need to see built so that we could move um, the country forward. We have two major groups in this country, in Guyana, and they're basically the Blacks and the East Indians. And um, we have found ourselves in a position where um, elections, the election is won based upon race. And so what we find is that blacks gravitate to, um, if, the, if, the, if the, the person who's running for president is black, the blacks go there, the Indians go there, go towards the Indians. What has happened is that in terms of the Indians, they actually outnumber the blacks. So you find that if there is racial vote in one particular party could be, um, could be there forever. And so what we have seen is a coalition government form with this particular president that we have now, who was determined to change the status quo. So he actually formed um, a party um, with another party that contained lots of people of East Indian descent. So we have a coalition government where you see the faces, um, it, you see the diversity in, in leadership which I think is, is, so, is so critical at this point in time. So Guyana is, 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 is now in a better place in terms of bridging the racial divide because you have leadership um, at all levels and in, among the different races occupying um, positions in the party. In terms of um, the radical generosity, um, we practice something called first fruit. It's biblical, biblically based, but um, in January every year, regardless of whatever your salary is, we give the entire salary. I've been doing that for like, um, I think this is my fourth year now. Um, we've been doing that the entire salary. This has nothing to do with when you take out taxes and so on. The money that you would have paid for tax plus your, your net, everything you give. Now, this money is used for um, the expansion of the kingdom of God in terms of projects, um, feeding the sick. Um, taking care of the sick, feeding the poor. And so we have, you know, monies being, um, the money being used in that direction. It was something very difficult for me to do initially, but I found that once, once I would have started, it has become so easy for me in the month of January to prepare to take your first, take your salary for the first month, the first month in the year, to take the salary and give it. And so a number of our leaders would have been doing that. And the, the thing about it is it has now caught on to the congregation 
So sometimes when you look at the income in January, where people say it's a hard month because um, lots of people spend, do a lot of spending at Christmas in December. And so by the time January is there, you know, they, they have difficulty finding funds. But, you know, strange enough, Dr. Brian, in this hard month of January, we, um, we see the largest amount of income in, 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 in the church. And that income is being used, um, like I said, to promote um, feeding programs, clothing, uh, helping the sick, building projects and so on. So um, I think we, we, we're going places, but it's not an easy um, exercise. But like I said, once you start, uh, and then the thing is, uh, God is no man's debtor. And I found that since I've been doing that, you know, I can't remember having to beg anybody for anything because, you know, you give and it will be given back to you. And I, I believe a true test of your spirituality is in, in your giving. That has always been my concept. Lots of people could preach real good. Um, I myself am an evangelist. They preach with the fire of the Holy Ghost and, and they do, you know, preach real good, very articulate and so on in the church. They know the word of God, but when it comes to giving, people go into a shell. And I believe the true test of your Christianity is in your giving. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I love that example. What a great example. <laughs> the first, uh, it's all of January. The first month's uh, salary goes, it gets set aside for those programs. That's amazing. So, um, Natong, did you want to share a little bit about any examples? Have you seen radical generosity played out there or any examples of people who are um, in, engaging in primary justice or rectifying justice? <clears throat> Yeah, I would like to talk about two persons. But the first one, I don't know whether she will qualify for good example or I don't know. Uh, one of the ladies from my trap, she spent around, um, within, within three years, she spent around $3 million for those INDPs fleeing from their places. Uh, but after, after reading When Helping Hurt, I don't know whether I should appreciate her or not. As for her generosity, she spent a lot of her fortunes for helping the people. But now, when I, after reading the books, my mind is changed a little bit. <laughs> because uh, some of the people, they became dependent on her. Um, so I hope you get my point. Yeah. Um, most of the people, they no longer want to walk now. So. I don't know when I meet her, whether I should congratulate her or whether I should remind her again, of course. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have to appreciate her mind because three million, $3 million is not a small amount for us here in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. and, and one more example I want to share about one lawyer from my place as well. See, in my country, many Many farmers and peasants, they lost their, their lands to government officials. Most of them are uneducated and their lands are graphed by uh, those in authorities. So these people, they cannot, they don't have sufficient money to, to hire lawyers or do, to go to, to court. So most of them, they have to suffer lands grabbing. So, this loyal ladies, she will help with these farmers whose land has taken by the government officials. So I believe that's also a kind of radical justice because even when she doesn't get any money for working for them, she did all her best to secure their land back for them. So I believe this is a good example of a standing for the poor people. Thank you, Dr. McKeef. That's a great example. Uh, love to hear that. Uh, land rights is such a huge issue in so many countries around the world. Uh, you know, one in six people living on this planet lives in an urban slum somewhere without any land rights, uh, without any systems that are working for them, like education or healthcare or water. Uh, and then that's not even, that's just for the urban environments. There are many rural areas and farmers like you're describing that are having their land taken away. Uh, so that's a great example of, of uh, engaging 
with justice uh, to help not just give a person who had their land taken away just to give them something, but to really work with them to become empowered to get the land back. Uh, so good to hear about that. That's a great specific example. And the first one that you mentioned, you know, uh, it's, I have a lot of examples like that too. Even myself, it's, it's a journey for all of us of trying to decide when to give something, when not to. And uh, it's always a challenge. Uh, and when someone does make a mistake or maybe they're causing dependency, uh, the main thing is that it's, it's working with people to help them improve versus kind of scolding them for messing up by being generous. You know, it's, it's hey, can we look at this problem from maybe a different perspective and helping to build, build people up? So uh, it's always a fine line to walk to discourage somebody from being generous. Uh, but also to, there are so many great social entrepreneurship programs and, and different methods of empowering people out there that, uh, you know, we need to continue to keep those approaches in front of, of everybody. So <laughs> thank you for sharing those examples though. Uh, I'm not going to hold us uh, too much longer as we move forward. Cause I know everybody uh, has a lot going on. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight was just in the, uh, book when helping hurts there is a, a, a lot of good theology kind of interwoven throughout that book and um, the uh, it's on pages 54 through 59 of the the version that I put in the syllabus there's a couple different versions of the book but it's the chapter on what's the problem and it's if you have your book there or, or if you want to refer to it it's pages 54 through 59 but the main thing I, I wanted to highlight uh, was uh, they talked about they introduce a, a poverty, uh, a biblical framework of poverty. And instead of it just being material poverty, uh, the authors talk about how poverty is really a lack of, of right relationships. And these four relationships that they that they introduce that are kind of from the beginning of creation uh, are relationship with God, relationship with self, relationship with others and relationship with the rest of creation. And they talk about that as kind of the cultural mandate from Genesis 1, 28 through 30. Uh, the authors of the book described how, you know, from a biblical perspective, when those relationships are all right, then you're not going to experience poverty. You're going to have kind of human beings flourishing uh, because of right relationships and all that God made them to be. And uh, they also, uh, just some examples that they provided of that, are uh, the four relationships highlight the fact, I'm reading on page 57, uh, the four relationships highlight the fact that human beings are multifaceted, implying that poverty alleviation, a poverty alleviation effort should be multifaceted as well. So there's no one size fits all. There's no just addressing the material problems. It's working with human beings through every part of who they are, social and emotional and physical and mental. Um, and then they uh, talked about, you know, caring for creation uh, systems. Sarah brought up systems. So we engage at the individual level, but we also work towards transforming the systems. If there's systemic brokenness, uh, we need to lean in and uh, engage in those areas. Uh, and then uh, the authors noted, we are not bringing Christ to poor communities. He has been active in these communities since the creation of the world, sustaining them by his powerful word from Hebrews 1.3. Uh, hence, a significant part of working in poor communities involves discovering and appreciating what God has been doing there for a long time. Uh, this is a big problem for U.S. Uh, Christians uh, because in, we're coming out of Western theology where uh, a lot of Western theology has a distrust of the Holy Spirit's work in the world. And we feel like we have a corner on the Holy Spirit and we take God with us whenever we go to a place versus a more Eastern approach to, uh, to Christianity assumes that the spirit is always at work in all places. And our work is to just participate uh, with what God is doing, assuming that, that, uh, that God is uh, at work there. One of the best examples of that is in Acts 19, when Paul arrives in Ephesus and finds believers there who have been baptized in, uh, not in the Holy Spirit or in Jesus Christ, they were baptized by John the Baptist. And so uh, Paul assumed that the Spirit was already at work there. And he just said, hey, this is what it really is. Let's baptize you in, in the name of Jesus. And, and they received the Holy Spirit. And the church, as we all know, uh, exploded in growth in Ephesus, uh, but based off of that missional approach that, that the Holy Spirit is already at work in a place. Uh, and then on page 59, 
Uh, they talk about the fall, so how the systems become broken and how individuals become broken and how poverty then takes place. Again, not just material poverty, but poverty of relationships. And on, on page 59, uh, the author said, poverty is the result of relationships that do not work, that are not just, that are not for life, that are not harmonious or enjoyable. Poverty is the absence of shalom in all its meaning. And what I wanted to, to uh, ask you about, and then uh, we'll just, uh, this will be the last thing that we do and then we'll end the, the Zoom room here. Uh, but talking about, a theological basis for for poverty alleviation. Um, my first question uh, is, what would what does shalom look like? What does God's shalom look like in your context when people are thriving? Is it those right relationships that we talked about? Is it something else that comes to your mind? Uh, but you know, the Bible kind of creates this picture in creation of us getting along with God and with each other and, and not have any problems with understanding our worth and caring for creation and stewarding creation. And then kind of brokenness happening in so many of those areas with the fall so that we're, our work is frustrated. You know, I, every time we make progress, it seems like we take a step back and we have to have a really strong trust of what God's doing. Uh, so but that, that's my simple question as we wrap up today is, is what does Shalom look like? Uh, in your uh, context, what does it look like for people to thrive in, in your in your context? Could I go first? Yes, please. Because <laughs> I, I was waiting, but uh, I I know we pressed the time, so I didn't want to um, start. So, so let me go first. Um, in, like I said, in, in our context, I think if, if because shalom actually has to do, like you said earlier, it has to do, it's not only peace, it goes beyond peace. Um, according to one of my professors, it speaks to when everything is working well in the society, the relationships and so on. I believe in, 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 in my cultural context, there's a brokenness in terms of, of relationship. Um, and then we also have uh, a situation where because there is a, a multiplicity of religions, because the whole culture is multi-ethnic, um, and so if you're looking at Shalom from a biblical perspective, it is extremely difficult um, because we have Hindus, we have Muslims, we have Baha'is, and we have all these different groups of persons. And uh, I think from what um, Corbett and think that there's, they're talking about the centrality of this whole shalom has to do with right relationship with God. The question we have here now as a Christian, um, how does an Hindu um, develop this right relationship with God? Because we're talking, about, um, we're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so because we have these variations, it becomes very difficult for us to enjoy this shalom. Because remember... Um, if we, are, if we have people with different religious views and orientations and beliefs, there's a difficulty there in actually bringing them together in terms of forming this kind of relationship um, with God. So we see that there with God. We see that brokenness in terms of relationships um, because people tend to work with people of their own kind and their own race. But like I said, um, in our context, um, the new president that we've had in Guyana has really been moving in this direction. He's an Anglican, and maybe because he's an Anglican, he's able to do some things that will, that, that, that will lead to Shalom. Uh, for example, the education system, we have nine, um, ten educational districts. There were times when some districts would have been left unattended because those districts don't bring, um, never brought in votes, so to speak. Now we have gone past that in, in, in this dispensation where everyone is being... Um, is being catered for, but I don't know how, maybe you could advise us how we could fix that part with God, because I know we're not talking about Ram and Shiva and Selassie, we're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and when persons are holding on to these things, I guess in terms of bringing Shalom, um, serious evangelism will have to take place, a deliberate effort to, you know, to, to, to um, build relationships with those people. I'm not saying, Dr. Brian, that not because a man is of a different religion, we can't work with him. 
but you will recognize, and I've learned that in Fresno, but you will recognize that in certain um, cultural context, it becomes extremely difficult, especially when you're dealing with, dealing with extremists. There's some people who will not even want to work with you um, because you're a Christian. I think here is where prayer, and um, we have to spend time praying and trusting God for relationships, you know, to be built and so on, because I believe all things are possible um, with God. And I think that has been our orientation, not to give up, but to continue pressing in um, to build those relationships. Thank you. I know we press for time. I don't want to ramble. <laughs> well, we're definitely not going to uh, tackle the entire how to uh, interact with other religions in, in, in your context of in our limited time that we have here. But it is a pressing issue around the world, for sure. Uh, around 34% of the world's population claim to be followers of Jesus. Uh, and, um, of course, with um, Islam and, and uh, Hinduism and other religions, I mean, the there's all these clashes that are happening, a lot of violence happening. So it is a pressing issue for Christians, for sure, uh, to understand how to interact with people of different religions. Um, my, the only thing I was going to say about that, because each context is different, is uh, I think it's really important for the Christians to remain hopeful and open. You know, uh, as you ended your statement with there, uh, the worst thing that can happen is we just close ourselves off and say, you know what, we're just not even going to interact with you anymore. And, you know, because you might uh, enact violence to us with words or, or with actions. And, uh, you know, Christians should be the ones that are the most capable of navigating through um, persecution, through suffering, through, uh, through, um, you know, people speaking badly of us and uh, we should be the most, you know, the fruits of the spirit. It's not something that we do on our own effort. It's something that we trust the spirit to give us in each situation that we interact and trusting the work of transformation that the Holy Spirit does in other human beings, uh, especially if they're of other religions. Uh, that was a really general answer, but um, you know, I, I just, I feel so passionately uh, that it's our responsibility to remain hopeful and open and loving and engaging um, versus closing ourselves off. Um, but it's tough. You're right. What does what does shalom look like if people can't get along across uh, religious boundaries? It's one of the biggest issues in our world. Um, who else wants to share about what shalom looks like in your context? Yeah, may I come in? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, I think this is a very good reflection, and uh, it uh, it was uh, some of the things I was reflecting on last week when I was in in Ethiopia. Um, we were hearing uh, from uh, media in Addis, while in Addis with my wife, uh, about uh, Shalom and uh, the media talking about the peace, how important the peace is. Uh, they are making a dialogue, we talking to different people, religious leaders, political leaders, and uh, public opinion in general. And everybody is telling that uh, shalom is very important, which is very obvious. And I was asking myself and also discussed with my wife, why those people who are talking and discussing are not getting into the, the root cause that has made the shalom difficult in the society. So they don't want to touch that. In Ethiopia for the last uh, two or three years, we have a lot of problem. Uh, there are demonstrations, uh, people are rising, and uh, load, uh, road blockage, and um, a lot of things. Interruption of education in universities, uh, interruption of travels, and uh, we used to get uh, a lot from tourism. Now people are fearing going to Ethiopia. So I was asking why are they not getting into the point that has made Shalom to be difficult, that has uh, made uh, uh, peace a problem. I, I couldn't see that in the discussion because whenever we have injustice, whenever the systems are not fair, um, we cannot expect shallow. So as you said, I think relationship between different structures, between the government bodies who are there just to keep themselves in power, who are using you now power to silence people's demand, uh, but preaching about the peace it will not bring a peace. It would have brought peace in Ethiopia because for the last many, many years, what the media is telling us is that how important the peace is, which we agree. 
but we have to do something else to make that peace happening. So I think uh, that is uh, our context uh, where um, the media is preaching about peace, but not preaching about addressing the underlying causes of conflict. Yeah, that is what I wanted to share. Yeah, that's, that's really deep, uh, that reflection right there, because, uh, you know, so many, um, so many, I think what you, the way that you said it was preaching in words are not going to bring about peace. Uh, there's been enough words, there's been enough sermons talking about how everybody needs to get along. Uh, and, and preaching alone won't bring about right relationships between people. Uh, and and uh, it's easy for us to compartmentalize uh, the things that we hear with words and then not live them out with our actions. So uh, I, I think what you touched on was a concept of modeling, which is extremely important for, for transformational leaders. Uh, uh, modeling is showing up in places and demonstrating what it looks like to have a right relationship with somebody that we're different than, and then trusting that God will then take those right relationships and, and uh, get that momentum going that more people will want to, to live like that, to interact like that. Uh, and you're providing an example then of what it looks like uh, for, for here uh, in my context in uh, the neighborhood where I am uh, in Homewood, there is a lot of fear of this neighborhood that there's a lot of violence that happens here that there's crime that happens here uh it's a primarily african-american neighborhood and most white people in the pittsburgh region will never go to homewood and so what i try to do is model out you know it's not okay for there to be a neighborhood where people are dying from gun violence and hurting each other and it's not okay for there to be deep racism in our city so uh, through our mentoring program, I mobilize people uh, from outside of Homewood and also inside Homewood in relationships with each other. And it's amazing to see uh, it, it moves past the words and it gets into people being in relationships. And then somehow God does an amazing work of transformation. Shalom in terms of health in the neighborhood starts to rise and kids get a better education and less violence happens, but also God transforms the worldview of the person who's mentoring the young people. And then they start to have a different narrative of, and then Shalom starts to take place in their life because they're in a right relationship. All that to say, uh, you know, collectively, uh, once that momentum gets going, uh, you really start to see God at work and, and shalom taking place. Uh, but it does start so, so much so with actions and not necessarily words. Uh, so again, you, uh, that's really important for us to keep in mind. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Anybody else want to share? What does shalom look like in your context? We just have a few more minutes here, but I wanted to give everyone a chance if you want to share. I'll, I'll just share, it's, it's similar. I think um, one thing we, we're kind of, a, uh, our organization and our community is about neighborhood transformation. It's very similar to what you're talking about, Professor, but one question that we, or one thing we would always say is, hey, we want our neighborhoods to be the best place to raise fam a family. So, sorry, you can probably hear my family in the back, but um, I think that's the same thing you're talking about. Like, it's just, you know, an equality conversation, like why do certain neighborhoods have to be the neighborhoods you move into to go to the good schools? Like that's just not okay. And why, you know, and why can't, I think Shalom looks like a place where everyone, every family, every neighborhood is a great and healthy and thriving neighborhood. And so how, you know, how do we participate in, in that transformation? Um, and, and, you know, and help, um, help bring the kind of resources that every neighborhood that sh every neighborhood should have um so that's kind of the work that we're doing so that's our kind of sometimes that's our view of shalom in our neighborhoods is a healthy thriving place for that's great for families that people want to move to for families or you know that's just really a healthy place yeah, that, that's what it looks like really tangibly, right? Can, can children get a good education? Can somebody get a job that can support their family with a living wage? Uh, can the 
the laws that are in place there be just laws that allow people to be able to live and have freedom and to thrive? And do the police enforce those laws justly and fairly? Uh, you know, and, and there are so many ways, ec economically, uh, there's so many different, different ways that that looks like. But, uh, you know, that's, it's a good question that you asked uh, of, you know, what does it look like? Like, what does it mean to have in a city places where certain people get that and certain people don't? just based off of where they were born and uh, what, what society thinks about them or their family or their culture. And uh, that should, that's a deeply troubling question for a lot of Christian leaders that we have to wrestle with uh, in our cities. So thanks for sharing. Uh, I think for this one, we heard from uh, a few of you. Anybody else want to jump in on, on that? Yeah, in my context, <clears throat> I think our divine shalom means when everyone is fulfilled and everyone is satisfied individually and collectively, whether at home, uh, at work, at home or in the church, and there is no more war or no more minority groups or majority groups, etc. So I would say we have fulfillment and we have happiness. That's for me, it is shalom. Mm. Thank you. Fulfillment and happiness. <laughs> that's great. And I think, uh, again, the, the narrative that's playing out in your country, we're hearing it a lot in, in the U.S., I know. Uh, and it's a lot of heartbreaking. Um, you know, not, not only that um, people cannot experience shalom, but that being forced to leave or, or are feeling like they have to flee um, you know, that's pretty much the ultimate example of not only are you not experiencing fulfillment and happiness, but you can't stay. And there are 250 million people around the world right now who are displaced um, and who would like to be somewhere, but they can't. And uh, that's really a huge challenge for the church uh, to try to figure out how we're going to respond to that. So that's pretty much the definition of the absence of, of shalom. Uh, all right. Um, any final, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up here. And I know, uh, again, thank you all for, for joining this time and for sharing. Uh, again, just a, a reminder, um, you know, at BGU, it's, it's, the goal is not for me to get on here in the Zoom room and lecture for an hour and a half or two hours. You know, the goal is for us to get some, to take some times like this just to introduce some content and have some great discussion between you. So thank you for doing that today, for engaging with this material and sharing from your environment. I hope you'll keep that going in the online discussions this week uh, and, and all that interaction going with each other. It's really helping to make this a wonderful class. I'm just so blessed to hear from all your different perspectives. I can't wait to see where this course continues to take us each week as we process through a lot of these things. Um, so again, I'm always available uh, if you need to touch base via email or Skype, uh, if you need to work through anything. Uh, but thank you for your engagement. Any other final questions or comments before I wrap this up? All right, well, let me pray for us. God, thank you for this group and for this time today. Uh, God, I pray for each of these specific contexts that were mentioned, that these would not just be words that were shared in this Zoom room, that you would work through your spirit, through each one of these leaders to empower them to continue to transform their cities, to bring about the shalom that you so desire to see in these neighborhoods and in these cities. Uh, God, that you would uh, move us forward that this wouldn't just be an online class at BGU, that this would be a marker in our lives where we uh, read through these materials and interacted with each other and were able to move our leadership forward in healthy ways to uh, address these complex challenges that we're facing in so many parts of the globe right now that's so desperately needed. Uh, so God, we seal that up in your name. We know that you empower us to accomplish your purposes. If anyone's feeling tired or overwhelmed by the course or by their work or by their context, that you would give them a fresh filling of your spirit right now to continue on another day and, and another week and another month and a year to continue to make a difference in all of these areas. So God, we give you uh, the rest of, uh, uh, of this uh, day or evening, wherever we are. And uh, we need you, God. We, we praise you and thank you for what you did during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right.